Hey everybody, it's Allison Harrell with the Fort Bend Museum. Today I'm at the George Ranch because we are going to be talking all about cattle drives and the chuck wagon. So the first thing we have to talk about is what is a cattle drive? So cattle drives are a tradition of moving cows from point A to point B. Traditionally, you are moving cows from a place that has a lot of cows, like Texas, to a place that does not have a lot of cows in order to sell those cows at market and make the most profit. Now, the Spanish were a big fan of the cattle drive, and there's actually a cattle drive tradition in a lot of places in North America that have strong Spanish influence. So Texas, California, and Mexico all have that cattle drive tradition. Now, Texas didn't have a lot of cattle drives before about 1836, and that's because people were just moving there and just sort of moving the cows around. Starting in 1836, they started sending cows to New Orleans. That was the closest port city. So they'd send them just over the border to Louisiana, to New Orleans, where they'd be sold at market. Now, this happened starting after Texas was a republic. So as a republic, Texas needed a new way to make money, and the ranchers suddenly had enough cows that they could start selling some off. So they would sell them at the closest market in New Orleans. But they very quickly figured out that New Orleans didn't necessarily have the best prices because there wasn't a scarcity of cows in New Orleans. You could get cows there. But if they sent their cows northward to Missouri, there was a better market for the cows there. So they started sending their cows up north in the 1840s. So in the 1840s, Missouri was the popular destination, but there quickly became a problem. If you remember from our Texas Longhorn video, we talked about how the Texas Longhorn is disease resistant, and they are, they're very hardy animals. But that doesn't mean that they can't pass those diseases that don't affect them onto other cows. And this became an issue. The Texas Longhorn had a tick that could grow on the Longhorn and it would kill a lesser cow, but it didn't affect the Texas Longhorn. So when the cattle ranchers were driving cows through Missouri, these ticks would fall off the Texas Longhorn and then attach themselves to other cattle that lived in Missouri. Those cows would get the fever and then they'd die. So Missouri farmers pretty quickly figured out what was happening and decided that they were gonna do something about it. And what they were going to do is prohibit Texas cows from passing through their state. So pretty quickly, Missouri passed legislation that made it illegal to pass Texas cows through their state. So the Texas ranchers did the next logical thing. They just shifted their route over so that they were going through Kansas instead. Now, by 1859, all of Kansas had also realized this was a problem, and they had also passed legislation outlawing Texas cows from traveling through Kansas because these cows carry disease. Before we move on and talk about events that happened after 1859, I do want to back up a little bit and mention something that happened in the 1840s. So in 1848, gold was discovered in California. This started the California Gold Rush. Now, the California Gold Rush saw a lot of people across all of the United States of America moving from their homes to California, hoping to find gold and strike it rich. So in California, there was suddenly a mass market of people that needed food and they had cash to pay for it. So a number of Texas ranchers and Texas cattlemen began sending cows that way to California. And this started the sort of process of making a lot of money from a cattle drive. You would always make some money, but this would make you a lot more. So actually a number of different people from around the world came to America, gathered up cows, drove them across America to California and sold them at a massive profit. One of the people from Texas who did this was Oliver Loving. Remember that name, we're gonna talk about him more later. Okay, now we're at 1860. The Texas cattle drive is a long established tradition. The California gold rush has shown people that they can make a lot of money from running cows um, to different markets. And Missouri and Kansas have both outlawed the Texas longhorn due to them carrying that one disease ridden tick. So starting in 1861, we have the civil war. The Civil War created a very interesting problem for Texas because during the Civil War, there was no market for cows. There was no way you could send your cows north to sell them because you had southern cows, and there was no way you could send your cows across the south to the other markets that needed cows at the time because they were seized. This became quite an issue. So there was just no market to sell a cow during the Civil War. This did not stop the Texas Longhorn from multiplying. 
So at the end of the Civil War, Texas is in a really unique situation. <laughs> Number one, they have a whole lot of cows, but within Texas, no one wants them because everyone has them. So cattle within Texas were selling for about $2 a head. Number two, untreated cows were not allowed to travel through Missouri or Kansas, which is where the railheads were. This is where the end of the rail lines were at the time, and that's how you could get your cows to market, like the giant meat markets that were being constructed in Chicago. Now at that Chicago meat market, the same cow that would sell for $2 a head in Texas would sell for $40 a head. So there was a large incentive to get your cows to the rail yards and to the rail heads to get to the meat markets in Chicago so that you could make a massive profit from selling your cows. So the first thing that the Texas ranchers had to deal with is how to send their cows through Missouri and Kansas. Now, Missouri and Kansas have made it illegal to send Texas longhorns that have been untreated through their states. So the Texas cattlemen had to come up with a solution and the solution they came up with was the dipping vat. Now I'm gonna throw this over to Cody Kalinowski who's going to explain the dipping vat, what it was used for and how it functioned. This vat here is used for pest treatment usually. The historic pest that was really the hot one at the time of the cattle complex here was the Texas brown fever tick. The tick was, a, like its name implies, carried a pretty bad fever um, called the Texas fever, pretty creative name. To kind of combat this tick, um, the vat was constructed with the purpose of sending these animals through and inside the water mixed into the vat, um, you have a couple of different solutions that are known to be deadly to insects. Uh, the main original component used with the origin of this vat was an arsenic-based solution. Now later on, um, towards the end of the dipping vat days, they determined that this solution was environmentally harmful, which kind of spilled the end of the dipping vats. They were concerned that the arsenic-based solution being splashed out of the vat into the soil was the contaminant in drinking water. And then uh, subsequently um, poisoning people through that contaminated drinking water, making a lot of people sick. So these vats were then outlawed and declared illegal um, with the hopes of better um, and benefiting our environment with them not being around anymore. This vat was filled in and bored over the top. We were able to open it back up with the grant, stating that we could use it for educational purposes and demonstrational purposes only. Now the dipping vat here at the George Ranch, it is a 30 foot long dipping vat. Um, it has a six foot wide end at the beginning of our slide here. Um, at the end where our um, steps are, it tapers down to about a five foot uh, width. And depth wise, you're looking around 10 feet um, for the depth of the vat here. Um, the 10 foot depth is pretty important for the function of the vat as well as the safety of the animals um, when there the dipping process does kind of um, occur. Um, we have to have these, these animals most of the time we're dipping. Um, they're up to about 1,200 pounds a piece, the full grown cows are. Um, so that animal has to have room for it to be completely submerged inside the water and solution that we have inside the water for the dipping purpose. The safety aspect of it is, uh, like I said, we have a 1,200 pound animal. Um, oftentimes this animal is, is being pushed pretty hard. It's pretty excited. It's going to jump in the water. We have to have room for that animal to sink um, and not worry about it having to hit the bottom or break any bones and such on our concrete barriers. The makeup of this vat is pretty unique to most vats you'll find um, historically. Most vats um, were not cemented in to the ground. Um, rather, they were just some dirt holes dug into the, gr uh, into the ground with some boards on the side to keep the dirt from falling in. The vat here at the ranch is a pretty nice vat with, uh, with a nice concrete structure around it. So today, uh, we just have a simple water-based solution. There's no chemicals mixed in whatsoever. It's just plain old, clean, dirty water. Uh, from time to time, grass and, and, and debris blows in from the wind from day to day, especially in the winter when it's extra windy. And whatever these cows drag in also kind of what makes its way in here. Um, but it's just a, it's just a normal water-based solution. Every once in a while, we add a little bit of uh, chlorine, chlorine to kind of keep some of the smell down in between cleanings. Uh, but besides that, just water. So we, we use it today. Um, for demonstrational purposes, we use it about four times a day for, for our demonstration purposes when, when we have a up and really busy schedule. Uh, historically, I believe the main use was every week for three to four weeks up to the point they were sold um, to really treat for that life cycle of that tick, the Texas brown fever tick, its life cycle and its eggs life cycle were around three to four weeks. Um, so it's very important for that animal to be treated every week for those three to four weeks so we can ensure that there's no chance of that tick escaping out outside the state here to contaminate any other herds um, across the country.
And if you want to see the dipping vat in action, you'll have to come out to the George Ranch Historical Park. So now that we know how Texas ranchers made their cows safe to travel through other states, let's talk about cattle drives themselves, along with some specific innovators. So we're going to start with Charles Goodnight and Oliver Loving. Remember him from earlier? So Charles Goodnight and Oliver Loving in the spring of 1866 set out from Fort Belcamp along the Pecos River and they made it all the way up to Fort Sumner. This trail later became known as the Goodnight Loving Trail. It was named after them and eventually the trail was extended all the way up to Wyoming. This cattle drive was really important because it's also the first instance of the chuck wagon being used. The chuck wagon was something that Charles Goodnight came up with. This was basically a portable kitchen. This wagon had all the accessories and all the things you would need in order to cook a meal and it was portable. The cook was in charge of the chuck wagon and he became an important part of the cattle drive. Here's a little quote from Cody about why the chuck wagon was so important to the cowboys. Okay, so a chuck wagon, the way that cowboys saw it at the time and often do see it sometimes in some modern uses today of the chuck wagon, um, is, is essentially a cowboy's home away from home. These cowboys, they were on cattle drives, often months away from home at a time to have any sort of comfort out in the range. You can only pack so much on your saddle in your saddlebags. To have any type of comfort, these chuck wagons were used for a nice sit down at the end of the day after 10 hours, 12 hours of riding a day, covered in dust, um, just just hearing the beller and the holler and the cattle all day, he had a splitting headache. They could sit down with a nice, real rounded meal that was warm off the fire they could have a decent meal, sleep a little easier at night, and that way repeat that long, arduous process of work the next day on the next part of the cattle drive. The chuck wagon became an important part of the cattle drive from that point forward because it was run by the cook, and it was also the source of food and medical supplies for the cowboys. A typical cattle drive could have around 3,000 cows, but only 10 cowboys. You would have the chuck wagon with the chuck wagon cook, and then you might also have a horse wrangler who would be wrangling the different um, spare horses that the cowboys might need. So there's not a lot of staff involved with the cattle drive, and you have really bare bones, and so every person has a very important part. Now the Goodnight Loving Trail was not the only trail that was used for cattle drives. There's also the Chisholm Trail. The Chisholm Trail was developed by a Native American and Jesse Chisholm, and it's named after Jesse. And it went from the Red River along the Texas border all the way up to Kansas City, Kansas, where the railroads were. Now, um, typically you wouldn't actually start driving your cows just from the Red River. That's just where this trail started. So a lot of people were gathering cows in the San Antonio and the Rio Grande area, and then driving their cows through the middle of Texas up to the Red River, and then they take the Chisholm Trail from there. So cattle drives were a really important way for ranchers to make a profit until the railroads came to Texas. So by the mid 1890s to 1910 really saw the death of the cattle drive. And that's because the railroad came to Texas. There was no need to drive your cows to other railroads anymore. You could just load your cows up from your ranch onto the railroad and send them straight to Chicago or any other market that you were interested in. There was no need, since there was no need to walk your cows this long distance to market, it also meant people could experiment with different breeds of cow. There was no need to only raise the hardy longhorn anymore. You could start experimenting with different cows that might be more valuable. This was around the time that fat in beef became really popular, and so people started growing the fattest cows they could. Hence, the Texas Livestock Show and Rodeo used to be the Texas Fat Stock Show and Rodeo, and the cows that were shown there had an unbelievable amount of weight on them. Ding. <laughs> Just because the cattle drive no longer exists in its original economic form does not mean that people do not still do cattle drives. Most of the time these days, they are a publicity stunt. In 1966, Charles Schreiner III, who started a longhorn herd as well, and the Texas Longhorn Breeders Association held a cattle drive to show off the longhorn and how great the breed was, and also to raise publicity for the Texas Longhorn Breeders Association. Now, this drive was a really unique one. It was very long, and he also managed to hire some people to simulate a Native American attack along the Red River. The Native Americans reacted to cattle drives in three different ways. Number one, sometimes they were the buyer at the end of the trail. The Goodnight Loving Trail actually went up to a number of different Native American posts, and so they were the ones buying the cows. Number two, 
they were hostile to this sort of impediment on their land. So they were not always pleased about the number of cows being trampled across the land that they'd been pushed upon. So sometimes they would attack the cattle drives. Ultimately, injuries from such an attack are what killed Oliver Loving, but um, Charles Goodnight did continue to give the Loving family his portion of the proceeds from the cattle drives for a number of years after his death. Or the third option, which is the Native American tribes would just charge them a toll per cow. So a number of groups would actually just charge the cattle drivers 10 cents per cow as they drove across their land and let them carry on. So um, simulating a Native American attack would have been sort of appropriate, but it ultimately ended up in spooking the cows in this 1966 cattle drive, and it took them a lot longer to gather the cows all back together than they anticipated. Today, the cattle drive is no longer a necessary part of ranching life. Um, you no longer have to drive your cows to market, you can actually just sell them straight from your ranch. So, hope you learned something about the cattle drive. <laughs>